Inside of Westminster Abbey are the tombs of two of England's Tudor queens. In fact, there are more Tudor consorts buried within Westminster Abbey, including Elizabeth of York and Anne of Cleves, Henry VIII's disastrous fourth wife. But the two women who ruled in their own right during the Tudor period had very different legacies, but today are buried inside of the same vault and the same tomb. Mary I has a notorious reputation in history, as she is remembered for being Bloody Mary, who would burn over 200 people at the stake who disagreed with her religious beliefs. She is considered rather insignificant in the canon of English history, and is in burial she is overshadowed by her half-sister Elizabeth I, who is buried directly on top of her. This is breaking into the tombs of the Tudor queens, and what happened when the tomb of both Elizabeth and Mary was broken into. One of the most notorious queens to ever have ruled over England is Bloody Mary I. She gained her nickname for the fact she burned over 200 people at the stake for their religious beliefs, and it was a time of great change and turmoil, yet again in the nation, as she restored Catholic beliefs and worship. But despite being the eldest daughter of King Henry VIII, Mary would rule for roughly five years until the age of 42. Inside of St James's Palace, she died, and she had suffered a significant amount during her short life. She was a woman whose health problems resulted in her death, and these had lasted some decades. But Mary today is laid to rest inside of Westminster Abbey, and her monument is rather insignificant compared to the fact her sister, Elizabeth I, is buried on top of her. But at some point, people broke into the tomb of Mary and Elizabeth. Mary I, throughout her reign, thought she was pregnant a number of times, and she would even have swellings of her stomach, but no baby or child would come. It's possible that this was actually ovarian or uterine cancer, but Mary would state in 1558, in her will, that her husband, Philip II of Spain, would be the regent of England during the minority of their children. But no child was ever born, and Mary then was forced to accept her half-sister, the future Elizabeth I, as her lawful successor. However, in England, around 1558, there was a terrible bout of influenza, which was killing people at the rate of the plague. This illness was not like the sweating sickness, which killed in hours and days. It would linger for a long period until someone finally succumbed to it. Mary would try to avoid this, but in spring and summer she was suffering with insomnia and depression, and she had a low fever in the August of 1558, and also dropsy, and it was known that she was in a bad way. Mary was moved from Hampton Court Palace to St James's Palace, and the following month she was suffering also from a high fever, headaches and periods of confusion. Mary also went nearly blind, and she would continue to feel worse, but then somehow slightly recover. But her depression also made her illness worse. It was clear to those in the Privy Council that by October 1558 that Mary was going to die, and she made her will. There were times where she was rational and was able to work, but in the early November there was some let-up. She agreed to name Elizabeth her successor, and then grew weaker and weaker as her advisers tried to save themselves, and they abandoned Mary for Elizabeth, her successor. Mary in the last days was blind, and her servants, who were loyal, remained around her bed, and they prayed for her salvation, and she was having rather joyous dreams in her final moments. In the early hours of November 17th, 1558, Mary heard a final mass, but then between four and five in the morning, she died peacefully. To her servants, they thought she was asleep and was better, but this was just death taking her, and the doctors confirmed her death. Her funeral service was then planned, and the Bishop of Winchester praised the Queen in the saying, She was a king's daughter, she was a king's sister, she was a king's wife, she was a queen, and by the same title, a king also. Mary was the first woman to claim the throne of England successfully and to rule following coronation, but she was then buried inside of Westminster Abbey. Her body was taken on a chariot to Westminster, and there was a lifelike effigy of Mary on the chariot. 
The effigy was dressed in robes of state with a crown, orb and sceptre, and her fingers had many rings on. The procession led into the abbey, and many ladies made up the different parts of it. But Mary, following this, was then buried in the north side of Henry VIII's chapel. But what was interesting is that no large tomb would be made for her. When Elizabeth I took the throne, following Elizabeth's much longer reign and her death, the new king, James I of England, then sought to bury Elizabeth in Westminster, but he decided to have her and Mary I buried together. A large tomb was made of Elizabeth, and then she was moved into this burial spot, but underneath her was the coffin of Bloody Mary I. They were buried together, in the same vault, and Mary lays at rest below Elizabeth, and there is no grand ornament or monument to mark her place in the abbey and in history, just a small stone that states that she is buried there. But in the 19th century, the tombs of Mary I and Elizabeth I were broken into. A book in 1880 was published by Arthur Stanley, who had been given permission to survey all the tombs inside of the abbey by Queen Victoria. He went into the crypts and the royal burial vaults, and he wrote detailed descriptions of the tombs and what he saw. These vaults were hidden, but he was trying to find the coffin of King James I, Elizabeth's successor. Stanley explored a narrow aisle underneath it, in the eastern end of Elizabeth I's monument, and here he found an opening in one of the walls. When he went inside, he saw a narrow vault with two coffins inside and these were Elizabeth and Mary's coffins. Arthur then wrote what he saw when he went into the vault, and he described Elizabeth's coffin. He stated, The excavations, however, had almost laid bare the wall immediately at the eastern end of the monument of Elizabeth, and through a small aperture a view was obtained into a low, narrow vault immediately beneath her tomb. It was instantly evident that it enclosed two coffins, and two only and it could not be doubted that these contained Elizabeth and her sister Mary, the upper one larger and more distinctly shaped in the form of the body, like that of Mary Queen of Scots, rested on the other. There was no disorder or decay, except the centering wood had fallen over the head of Elizabeth's coffin, and that the wood case had crumbled away at the sides and had drawn away part of the vault of the decaying lid. No coffin plate could be discovered, but fortunately the dim light fell on a fragment of the lid slightly carved. This led to a further search, and the original inscription was discovered. There was the Tudor badge, a full double rose, deeply but simply incised in outline on the middle of the cover, on each side the August initials E.R. and below, the memorable date 1603. The coffin lid had been further decorated with narrow moulded panelling, the coffin case was inch elm, but the ornamental lid containing the inscription and panelling was a fine oak half an inch thick, laid on the inch elm cover. The whole was covered with red silk velvet, of which much remained attached to the wood. And it had covered not only the sides and the ends, but also the ornamented oak cover, as through the bare wood hath not been through rich enough without the velvet." The sight of this secluded and narrow tomb, thus compressing in the closest grasp the two Tudor sisters, partners of the same throne and grave, sleeping in the hope of resurrection. The solemn majesty of the great queen thus reposing, as can hardly be doubted by her own desire, on her sister's coffin, was the more impressive from the contrast of its quiet calm with the confused and multitudinous decay of the Stuart vault, and of the fullness of its tragic interest with the vacancy of the deserted spaces which had been here hereto explored in the other parts of the chapel. The vault was then immediately closed, but many people who visit Westminster Abbey today walk past the grave of Mary I as they miss it. She's not given much respect in this, and it was done to symbolise her sister, Elizabeth I's supremacy in every way over Mary. But, the Catholic Queen did rule for five years, and inside the Abbey are many other kings and queens, many of whom do not have the profound legacy of Mary, but they are still given space and a proper tomb. One of the greatest monarchs in history to rule England was Elizabeth I. 
She, during her reign, saw off the threat from the Spanish Armada and also tried to unite the country in a number of ways. One of her most shocking actions was to order the execution of Mary Queen of Scots, who many believed was her biggest rival to the throne, as Catholics across England wanted the Scottish monarch to become queen. She faced many plots and was loved by her people. However, in the early hours of the 24th of March 1603, Elizabeth I died. The Elizabethan era was over, and as she did not have an heir, the throne of England passed to James VI of Scotland, who then became James I. But it was he who was responsible for ordering a funeral for Elizabeth, which benefited her status. He also sorted out her tomb and monument, but centuries on her coffin would be open and broken into. But what is the story of this? Elizabeth had become ill over a number of months, and she saw many of her friends die over the last few years of her life. She was 69 when she passed away, and on her deathbed, the Archbishop of Canterbury asked her to think towards God. It was said that her throat swelled, and she then fell into a deep depression, and she was losing the fight for life. She died in her privy chambers at Richmond Palace, and she made strict instructions that she did not want to be disemboweled, but this was not adhered to. Robert Cecil left orders with the surgeons to disembowel her and fill her insides with herbs and spices. The Queen was then embalmed and her body was placed inside of a lead-lined wooden coffin. She lay in state at Richmond for a number of days before she was taken down the Thames to the Palace of Whitehall. Her coffin was draped in velvet and was watched by six ladies, and it was said that when she travelled down river, the oars at every stroke did tears let fall. There are reports at this time that from the coffin there was a loud crack, which could have been Elizabeth's body and head breaking open the coffin. This, it's believed, was from the pressure of gases released from her dead body, and it was said that the force of the explosion splintered the wood and the seer cloth. But on the 28th of April, a month after, her body was taken on a grand procession to Westminster Abbey. It was said that the city of Westminster was surcharged with a multitude of all sorts of people in the streets, house, leads and gutters that came to see the obsequies. There was such a general sighing, groaning and weeping, as the like has not been seen or known in memory of man. On top of the coffin was the Queen's effigy, which was dressed in her Parliament robes with her crown on her head and her sceptre in her hand. The coffin was pulled by four horses, and she was then taken into Westminster Abbey for the funeral service. Dean Andrews conducted the funeral, and her coffin was then carried to the Henry VII's Lady Chapel. Initially, to begin with, her body was placed inside of the vault, which was also containing the body of her grandfather and grandmother, Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. But then in 1607, her coffin was moved to be in the same location as her half-sister Mary I, the Protestant Elizabeth was interred alongside her Catholic half-sister. It was said that 46 shillings and 4 pence was paid for the removal of the Queen's body to her new resting place. On top of this, a huge tomb, which cost £1,485, was commissioned and made which showed Elizabeth I on top. The tomb was lifelike, and today it's incredibly grand. Mary lays at rest below Elizabeth, but there is no grand and ornate monument to mark her place in history, only a small stone today states that Mary is actually buried there. But in the 19th century, the tomb of Elizabeth I was broken into. A book in 1880 was published by Arthur Stanley, who had been given permission to survey all the tombs inside of the abbey by Queen Victoria. He went into the crypts and the royal burial vaults, and he wrote detailed descriptions of the tombs and what he saw. These vaults were hidden, and he was trying to find the coffin of King James I, Elizabeth's successor. Stanley explored a narrow aisle underground, in the eastern end of Elizabeth I's monument, and here he found an opening in one of the walls. When he went inside, he saw a narrow vault and two coffins inside, and these were Elizabeth's and Mary's coffins. Arthur Stanley then wrote what he saw, and he went into the vault, and he described Elizabeth's coffin. He stated... The excavations, however, had almost laid bare the wall immediately at the eastern end of the monument of Elizabeth, and through a small aperture a view was obtained into a low, narrow vault immediately beneath her tomb. 
It was instantly evident that it enclosed two coffins and two only, and it could not be doubted that these contained Elizabeth and her sister Mary, the upper one larger and more distinctly shaped in the form of the body, like that of Mary Queen of Scots, rested on the other. There was no disorder or decay, except the centering wood had fallen over the head of Elizabeth's coffin, and that the wood case had crumbled away at the sides and had drawn away part vault of the decaying lid. No coffin plate could be discovered, but fortunately the dim light fell on a fragment of the lid slightly carved. This led to a further search, and the original inscription was discovered. There was the Tudor badge, a full double rose, deeply but simply incised in the outline of the middle of the cover. On each side, the August initials ER, and below, the memorial date, 1603. The coffin lid had been further decorated with narrow moulded panelling. The coffin case was of inch elm, but the ornamental lid containing the inscription and panelling was of fine oak, half an inch thick, laid on the inner elm cover. The whole was covered with red silk velvet, of which much remained attached to the wood, and it had covered not only the sides and ends, but also the ornamented oak cover, as though the bare wood had not been thought rich enough without the velvet. The sight of this secluded a narrow tomb, thus compressing in the closest grasp the two Tudor sisters, partners of the same throne and grave, sleeping in the hope of resurrection. The solemn majesty of the great queen thus reposing, as can hardly be doubted by her own desire, on her sister's coffin, was the more impressive form the contrast of its quiet calm with the confused and multidinuous decay of the Stuart vault, and the fullness of its tragic interest with the vacancy of the deserted spaces which had been hereinto explored in other parts of the chapel. The vault was then immediately closed. Today it's unlikely that anyone will ever be allowed into these royal vaults to document and photograph the coffins of the monarchs who lived centuries ago, but Stanley brings forward a brilliant account of the coffin of Elizabeth I, and where she rests today. But he remains one of the only people in history who has been able to see Elizabeth I's coffin, and the Tudor monarch's remains today are still located under the magnificent tomb of her. 